Bismillah. <laughs> In 1991, Sheikh Muhammad Jabali, who he just was talking about, actually lives in Medina now, but he, when he was doing his degree work in Texas, he was there in Arlington, Texas. And that particular masjid right there was, in those days, the only one we had. So that happens to be the same place where I did Shahada. And he is a great guy. Since then, alhamdulillah, we've shared the podium a number of times together. He's uh, also formerly the head of the uh, QSS, the Quran and Sunnah Society in the United States, if you ever heard of it. And they still have a website up. So, it's a good guy. And you can get some of his stuff is on one of our websites called watchislam.com. So, that's a look here. Look here. The topic tonight, what we want to talk about, is a subject that I think is probably, at least to some extent, a valid topic to every one of us. It's a subject of responding or being able to answer the harsh attacks and the criticisms that are coming toward Islam, the Muslims, the Prophet wasallam in every aspect of Islam. And I don't mean by this clearing up misconceptions. This is another subject. I'm talking about people who are intentionally attacking Islam or people who are following those who are intentionally attacking Islam. Now, how many of you speak Arabic? To call them Arabia. How many? About half? Alhamdulillah, this is good. Because you'll understand this very quick. If I talk to you about those who are Arab Christians and Jews, then you quickly, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But I will mention to you now something from the Quran, and this is for all of us to think about. When Allah says, Ya yuladina amanu, attaqallah wa kulu kawlin sadida. You hear this in the Juma khutbah, in the khutbah or speech that we have every Friday along with some of the other ayahs of the Qur'an, but the, the meaning behind it is very powerful. That Allah is telling the believers to have taqwa for Allah subhanahu ta'ala, but then always we have to say the truth. Throughout the Qur'an, you see there's this comparison between truth and falsehood, truth and falsehood. Even in the translations, you cannot help but pick it up. The haq and the battle. When someone is speaking the truth, or if somebody is qadib, a liar, these things are constantly coming up over and over and over throughout the Quran from the beginning up until the very end. Even at the very last surah of the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the wiswas, and the wiswas coming inside your heart from the jinn and mankind, and certainly you don't think he's wiswasing the truth to you. So obviously, you can see this from the beginning, from the very beginning, and all the way through the Quran, the subject of truth and falsehood being on the haq or being elsewhere. You know and I know that Islam is the only answer, it's the only solution. There isn't an option really to go to, to look at anything else. And as Muslim, we realize the value of telling the truth in everything we do anyway. We don't see any benefit in lying. Even a temporary benefit isn't really there. 
we know that you have to tell the truth. Even if it's against yourself, your family, you know the truth is the truth and you have to say it, the truth. And this is what one of the great things that makes us Muslim is that we know what the truth is and this is what we operate off of. This is how we function is from the standpoint of the truth. How critical is it to us when somebody talks about the Quran and the Quran is coming to us today from a rawaya or ijaza for how many uh, centuries but it's still exactly the same today as it was when it was revealed. This is, I mean, that, if I don't understand that, I don't even understand what's the Quran, right? You got to understand, this is a basic thing. The Quran is not changed, meaning what? That means that every time people said it, they said it exactly the way it was. In other words, they didn't add to or take away from. It's exactly the same. This is why sometimes you hear people when they say, Allah is Haq. Well, that's his name, Al Haq. The deen is Haq. It's the truth. The Quran is Haq. And Prophet Islam is, of course, on the Haq. So, this Haq or truth, absolute truth, is. We take it for granted. This is why when they want to compare their books, whatever they have, we're not going to accept that. We listen to them because out of politeness, we listen out of curiosity, but never would we be able to accept even the first verse when they start to recite it, especially if you've heard the Bible in Arabic. Anybody heard the Bible in Arabic? I left it in the room in the hotel. I wanted to bring it and let you hear it. I just wanted to let you hear it, but for whatever reason, the Lord didn't let me bring it. I didn't think about it until we were gone. But you can get it anytime you want to look at it. Any hotel or motel has right beside the bed a little nightstand or something there. You pull the drawer open. There's a book in there. What's the book? It ain't the yellow pages. Somebody already beat you to that one. No, it's the Bible. It's put there by the Gideon Society. And they're proud of the fact that they have translated this into 27 different languages. And they will show you that with an example of a verse in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 3, verse 16. They call it John 3, 16. It's the one, if you've ever heard them preach it, they say, for God so loved the world, and they go on from there. When it says that, and you find the word Allah in the Arabic, which is the second language. First one is Afrikaans in Arabic. You see it says, for Allah so loved the world. So it's very clear, but when you try to read it, you're going to look at it and you're going to say, oh, it's not even correct grammar. If you know Fusha, which is the Arabic, classical Arabic, and you read it, you're going to go, uh, who did this? You will never be fooled, not even for a second. I was thinking, actually, when I was looking at it tonight, that when we have these opportunities, when we have so many of the Arab Christians who do come to the programs, and they want to do this attacking thing that I was talking about, and by the way, it happened in Sydney the last time I was here, really nasty. But I was thinking, wouldn't it be something to let them say, okay, you've got your guys with you, Choose whoever you like. Let him stand up. And then choose any verse you like. And if you don't have one memorized in your, your language, because they won't, here's the Bible that we pulled out of the hotel. Just read that verse for us in your best voice. Go ahead. Then, listen to this. Choose any one of our guys that memorized the Quran. Anybody, I don't care. Pick the one you like. And then you go pick the verse, any verse you like from the Quran. Okay, then you recite. We'll let our guy recite. And let all those who don't know listen and see which one they like. I have no doubt what will happen. Because I've seen people who didn't know anything about Islam, Quran, Arabic language, 
nothing. Yet, when they heard Quran, all of a sudden you see tears start coming down their face. And maybe they'll even say, what is that? One time I was given a lecture for the elderly in San Antonio, Texas. They asked me to come and talk about what is the Islamic perspective on death and dying. So it was for old people. And in it I had recited some Quran. My voice is not all that great. And I don't claim to have a very good, you know, kira of Quran. But anyway, after it was over, this old man came up to me and they were all thanking me for coming out. And they're very sweet. And he said, man, that's the best singing I ever heard. <laughs> I said, singing? I was thinking, I didn't sing anything because, you know, I used to be a Christian and I was a music minister. So obviously I'm thinking, did I sing something? But he was talking about the Quran. So how much we've got going for us, we take it for granted. Let's talk about Hadith. Again, truth is critical to us. Do we accept hadith if somebody come in and say, hey, here's a hadith, blah, 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 blah. And you say, well, I never heard it before. And the guy says, uh, I didn't either, but, you know, I saw it on the back of an advertising on something and it looked like a good hadith. So where, where did it come from? Nobody knows. But still, it sounds nice, you know. So let's use it. Incorporate it into a talk or a program. Nobody would do that. They wouldn't do it. Where, where did it come from? You don't know where it came from? What book did it come out of? Who cares? It sounds nice. You know? Something really nice. You get those probably on the internet. You get email. Some brother or sister will send you something and you read it and you're going, uh, this doesn't sound right. But they're telling you if you pass this on to X amount of people or somebody else got it and they you had passed it on and they got some money and the other guy, he didn't pass it on, he dropped dead the next day or something like that. You're going, wait a minute. I'm definitely not going for this now. This is not Islam. It doesn't work like that. We're not going to be impressed if you come up with a hadith, especially if there's no Arabic for it. Say, what's the Arabic for it? Mm -hmm. Nobody knows? And you don't know where it came from? I'm sorry. I don't think it's a hadith. I think you pulled it off the internet. I think you got some little warm fuzzy that somebody sent to you and you just put a bismillah across the top and a salam alaikum across the bottom and sent it out to everybody on your list. I think that's what you did. Yeah? You know what I'm talking about. You've seen them, right? So? But if somebody shows you where the hadith is, in Sahih al-Bukhari or in Sahih Muslim and you can look at it and you said, there it is, right there. All of a sudden, this is part of our deen. It's not just a nice saying, it's part of our life. It's not an option to us all of a sudden, it's real. Yeah? Okay. For the other people, they don't have that. They don't even know what that is. They've never been exposed to real truth in their lives. They use the word. They know there's a difference between a lie and the truth, basically. But for many, even people with education, even people with degrees, people with social status, people with responsible positions in the world still have trouble differentiating between the truth and falsehood. Is that right or wrong? Remember Clinton? I did not, you remember what he said? Huh? Huh? And when they caught him, I won't say red-handed, but they had clear proof. And what did he say? What I meant was, 
It did he? And what about Nixon? Maybe some of you are too young to remember Richard Milhouse Nixon. I was there. I remember it real well. He put his hands like this. He said, I am not a crook. And then they proved that he was a big liar. <coughs> what about <coughs> the one we got now? Now remember, I got to go back home, so I'm going to stop back right there. <laughs> For a Muslim, the truth is not just being accurate in what you say. It also means that you're going to be accurate in your intention to go with it. Because you could be accurate, real accurate, and still be lying because you could just not say all the truth. You could just say part of the truth. Or, or you could say all the truth but not let the person understand how it comes, what it's relevant to. That'd still be a lie. I've never met any other group of people. I've met individuals, of course, who are truthful. But I never met a group of people more responsible for giving messages correctly than I have with Muslims. I never saw this from other people. When somebody gives you a mana and they said, I need you to tell Abdullah that I'm real sorry I couldn't see him before I caught the plane, I have to go. So when you see him, tell him I said, now your brain is already clicking in, Abdullah, he's, the Sheikh is leaving, he's giving me a, an amana. And I got to remember what he said. So when you go to him, you're going to say, Sheikh had a message. It's a mana. I have to give it to you. Now, even if I said stuff that you don't particularly agree with, you will tell him exactly what I said because that was the amana given to you. True or false? There's no doubt about it. And I promise you that's not the case in the rest of this society that we live in. You have no idea, really, the value of the truth unless you've lived without it. And then when it comes to you, it is sweet and it is beautiful. And those who live it, speak it, and practice it, they're beautiful people. I want to mention something to you that I've heard quite a lot of in the last 17 years. And I take exception to it and I don't agree with it because I don't believe it's the truth, although I've heard a lot of Muslims say it. The statement says, if you want to know Islam, you have to look to the Quran and the Sunnah, don't look at the Muslims. Because if you look at the Muslims, you don't want to know. Even the statement that someone said, if I would met Muslims first, I wouldn't even become a Muslim. Have you heard statements like this? Some of you may have fallen into this trap. This is not true. It only has some tiny truth in it, but it is not true. From a person who was not Muslim, didn't even know any Muslims, till I was in my late 40s, I immediately could see the difference between Muslims and non-Muslims on that one topic alone, the truth, and how valuable it is. So I say, if you want to know what's Islam, look to the good Muslims. Because if you're saying, if you said you can't find Islam, and like this is some sheikh even said it like this, that he went to Europe and when he came back, he made the statement that he found Islam without Muslims. And then when he gets back home, he finds Muslims without Islam. A very famous statement. I'm not going to say who said it, it doesn't matter. The point is that is not a good statement. 
that does more damage than it does good. In the Juma Khutbah, the Imam is supposed to admonish the community, and there's no doubt about it. But he still has a responsibility not to go too far. And that's going too far. Because when you do that, here's what the next thing will happen. And it has happened. We find ourselves criticizing the Muslims for their shortcomings and praising the non-Muslims and they don't even have the aqidah to know la ilaha illallah. Have you heard this happen? Yeah. They'll be saying, oh, man, you know, this guy, so-and-so, he's not a Muslim, but man, you know, he was very good with the business dealing we had with him, and he was, uh, la, 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 and he was on time. Wow. And then immediately on the Muslims, they don't pray, and they don't fast, and so on, and so on, and so on. And without realizing it, without thinking about it, you're absolutely doing the worst thing you can do to your own iman. You are basically throwing your belief in the toilet. You got me? It's not good. What is the order in Islam on how to look at your brother? If he makes even a mistake, do you immediately criticize or give excuse? Give him excuse? But only once? Twice. Three? Seven times 70. Seven times 70. We didn't even give him one. Example. We see our brother. Here comes Tariq. He's coming along. Hey, man, there's Tariq over there. Hey. <gasps> oh, my God. Man, look. He's got a can of beer in his hand. Ooh. Stop for a lot. What's that? Is that a cigarette he's got too? I don't know. It looks like he's got cigarettes and beer and everything. And look where he's going, man. Huh? He, went, he went in that place over there with, with, with all them women and stuff. Oh, wow. Mm. Stuff for the law, man. Mm. And he's always out there in Padre acting like he's some kind. Oh, man. Next time I see somebody, anybody. Hey, you know Tarek? Tarek who? You know Tarek? I bought them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Man, I don't want to say anything about anybody, but you ain't never seen him with any beer cans, have you? <laughs> <coughs> or smoking or going over that place over on such such Main Street over there and with the, huh? You saw him over there? I mean, I don't want to say anything, but you know. <laughs> I mean, I got to tell the truth. <laughs> When Sheikh was here from America, he told us we got to tell the truth. I got to tell you, man, uh, stop for a law. We didn't give him one excuse. What would happen? What would happen on the day of judgment if we found that what we said about him got spread around and other people spread it around? And it got back and it damaged his reputation, damaged him. And all he would say is, Allah knows best. Allah knows best. But then it comes on us. And come to find out what he was doing, there's a hadith of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever clears the way for the believers is getting an act of charity for each little thing he gets rid of. So when he reaches down and picks up that empty beer can, half empty beer can, and a cigarette that was laying there, looks for the closest place to throw it, and there's a door over there, you stick it in there, throw it in the trash, and he went on his business. And you did what? Ooh, big problem. You didn't even give him one excuse. So I want to come back now to our topic because it's very critical for us today. In spite of what other people are doing to us and attacking and saying the things that they're saying, we cannot do what they do. Now, this has been going on since before I got to Islam. Some of the Christians were down in South Africa really going after their business. That's what they do. This one group, the Jehovah's Witness, 
There's another group called the Mormons, but Jehovah's Witnesses were down there really pumping it up and blowing it out, talking with all their spiel that they've got. So some of the Muslims were taking exception to that. One of them ran across a series of some books that were 150 years old from one of the scholars in India who had developed this whole thing to respond back to those who were converting Muslims to Christianity. So this one, he took it, and it was a good orator, a good speaker, and a big guy on top of that. And he starts going after them and turning them around in their tracks. They couldn't wait to run away from this guy. But then it turns into debates, and then it becomes like a public thing, and then it becomes like, okay, half the room will be filled up with Christians, the other half will be filled up with Muslims. Huh? The Christians came. Sometimes more Christians than the Muslims. And this was the case down in Louisiana. And they brought the man all the way from South Africa to Louisiana. And they had a debate. It became very famous. They made videotapes, spread it all over the world. And you know which one I'm talking about, don't you? You no doubt in your mind what I'm talking about. How many of you ever been to Lafayette, Louisiana? Huh? Never. I have. I've been in those little villages, those little towns there, and I've talked to the people, the Muslims and the non-Muslims. Only question I had was, what was your relationship before and after the debate? What was the relationship, Muslims and Christians, before this debate? It was good. <coughs> Better than it was between, let us say, for instance, the Catholics and the Protestants, because they're mostly Louisiana is Catholic. They even have Catholic law still there today. It's the only state in the United States that does not have counties. It has parishes, and parishes are associated with the Catholic Church till this day. And they are under the structure, their constitution is more on the French law than it is on British, and again, I'm going to repeat, that's in Louisiana only. So in that state, where the Muslims had a better chance, were the Protestants, for sure, after the debate, they hated them. Until this day. I was there right after the Hurricane Katrina, and I talked with the people about this, some of the refugees that had left from it. We discussed some of these things in passing. I didn't let them know that that was a big issue, that I was you know, just dialoguing, talking, but I wanted to find out. I talked to two people on two different occasions, once when I was in Hodge and the other when I was down there after Katrina, who were there at the debate. And I asked them, what was the response of the people? When it started out, we could talk to them easily. After I, afterwards, everybody was polarized. You know what polarized means? It has nothing to do with the North Pole, South Pole. It's talking about the poles of a magnet. You're attracted to each other and away from them. Each of the communities that I've visited where they've done these kind of debates suffers more than it gains. That's why I refuse to do the debates. Not because I don't think I can beat somebody talking. <laughs> I got no problem doing that. But because I know Allah is not going to like it. And when I was here the last time down in Sydney, that's exactly what they tried to start out with. And I told them I wouldn't even come over here if they were going to do that. The reason I came was to keep them from doing that. They were going to get somebody else to do this debate stuff, and it was going to be real serious. The plan was to bring in three of the top Christian guys and put one of the Muslims from America up against them. 
and then have a judge sit and listen to the whole thing and make a final judgment. It was going to be broadcast and everything. What do you think would have happened after that? Well, I got news for you. It would have been a huge collision because only a month later, two months, wasn't it? Seven, seven. Remember that? Remember what happened in England? That was just two months later. Do you have any idea how bad the Muslims would have looked in all of Australia? You'd probably all be living in a refugee camp right now. Do you think I'm joking, huh? Alhamdulillah, we were able to avert that. What I told them was, we'll come and we will just talk about the nice things of Islam. They said, we've got this one guy, though, now we've already started. He wants to do it. I said, only if it's a dialogue. He finally agreed to a dialogue. Dialogue means, die means two, by the way. Log, speak. Dialogue. So, okay. And the deal is, we'll each talk about the good things that we have that will contribute to the community and the future of our children. Let's build it on that and go for it. And that was the premise from all the way back in November, December, like that, all the way up till I came here in May or June of the end of May or whatever it was of that year. And subhanAllah, everything went so smooth the whole time I was here because we kept focus on that one thing. Talk about the good of what we both have. Maybe some of you heard of Fred Niles. He was one of those that I went and spoke to and he turned around 180 degrees and he was looking actually positive toward Muslims and toward Islam. <laughs> He even, while we did Salah, he stood behind us and he was praying like this and crying. And I went to him afterwards and he was very positive toward Islam. Didn't last, as you well know what happened right after that. But we tried and then what happened? On that last event, on the last day, the one representing the Christians came and broke his word on every point. Said he wasn't gonna do it, he did it. Said he would do this or that, he didn't do it. Each thing that he saw, he did the opposite of. And the Muslims had worked closely with him. Ask him, go to Sydney and ask him. Well, they did. They had a barbecue for the, for the youth and they brought him over and fed him. They played soccer with him. They even brought a well-known soccer player and let him meet him, get autographs, that kind of thing. Nice. But when he got up on the stage, he had a Quran and a Bible in his hand. Already I know it's a problem. You know why? You see me with anything up here? Well, I need that for. If I need to open a book and read out of it, I don't need to be giving a speech about it, do I? Do I? No, <laughs> you don't need to be looking up something if you're going to give a talk. You either know it or you don't. Why he's got both books? Because he's going to use it as props to show people. You know what the Bible says. This is what Christians do. You know what the Quran said. Like one of those deals. We had exactly 30 minutes each. He said he needed more time. I said, let him have some of my time. It's all right. Give him five minutes of mine. I'll talk 25. Let him talk 35. I don't care. It's be all right. But one thing I asked the moderator to do, when you get up there, read this. It says, it's not a debate. We're not here to attack each other's religion. We're here to talk about the positive future for our youth and the good that we have and let people see what it is and leave it at that. When he started speaking, he didn't wait two seconds before he was saying really bad things against Prophet Muhammad And then, misquoting the Quran, Talking about hadith I didn't ever hear of before. I'm sure that they're hadith because I could see where he got them from. He had with him Arab Christians sitting right there, feeding him like spoon feeding, you know? Say this, say that. They'd been brainwashing him for two weeks just for this purpose. And he came down, bam, bam, bam. And for one whole hour, he used up all the time. The brothers asked me, aren't you going to make any notes? I said, for what? I said, Joe, you can just say he did, did, did. I said, this is a debate. We're not going to do it. After our break, when we came back in, 
I told him, I said, there's no point in talking. They said, go ahead and try anyway. I said, well, you know, most of the people are leaving. But I went up on the stage, <clears throat> and I told him that I was real happy to be here in Australia. I always wanted to get to see kangaroos and guys fighting crocodiles and figure out how guys can hang on to the end of the globe like you guys do down here. I was trying to figure out how you didn't fall off, you know? Because I wanted them to relax a little bit, laugh it up and, and relax because there's no way I can come in and pick up after what he did. Then I did, the only thing I could think to do is just talk about my trip since I've been there and the good things that I saw from the Christians and the Muslims working together. And I mentioned the name of the people that they knew, even one of them from the Uniting Methodist Church, is that what they call it? We have united, they have uniting, I think, here, yeah? Well, this one, at the end of his speech, he said, I'm calling for the reinstitution of the Sharia of Islam. If we had it in Christianity, I would call for it. We don't have it. They do, and we need it. This is what he said. I said, I don't need to give a speech after that guy. That's great. No, I just say amen and <laughs> let's go for it. <laughs> if I had to call for it, they probably wouldn't let me go home. <laughs> but alhamdulillah, we had a lot of good things. Then I just pointed to him and I said, the only disappointment I've had is sitting in that chair right there. Because before we came out here, and what we talked about the last six months was what you heard the moderator say. This was not to be a debate. This was not to cut each other down. This was not to put anybody down. All it was was to show the good that we had from both sides so that our youth can find things that they can work together on to build the future here in Australia. That was our topic, if you remember. In the meantime, I checked him out because I never took my finger off of his face. I just kept pointing to him. When I turned and looked at him, man, he was red-faced and looking down. So I said, so I'm not going to respond to his misconceptions, misunderstandings, misquotes from his book, misquotes from our book. Instead, I'm just going to tell you the three words I came out here to tell you about, and then I'm going to go. In case you didn't figure it out, I just responded to everything he said in one sentence. So I gave him the meaning of the word Islam, the word of the Muslim, the word Allah. I have four words because I talked about the Quran. What does it actually mean? That was it. And I felt like, well, you know, I did my job. I'll go. A guy came up on the stage. And I was telling him, you know, you got to get off the stage. You can't come up here because the, the people milling around and everything. And you don't know who's got what kind of agenda going on in their head. He wasn't a Muslim, you know. And he said, but I want to make shahada. I said, what? He said, get up on this stage. <laughs> and he did his shahada. A young man, I think he was in the Australian Navy or something, was behind us on the bleacher area over there. And he said, I want to as well. And he entered Islam. Then there were some girls, three, right over in the area, right over there. That we took the microphone over to them, and they did shahada. Now, they're making shahada after this guy insulted Islam every way he could think to do it. And it's not because of me. But I guarantee you, if I would have done what was inside of me to do, that would have been a big problem for me. Allah would have made a problem for me. Because haq is haq. And when they play their games, we still cannot respond that way. We've been told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very clear that you have to be patient and forbearing. They plan and Allah plans, not you plan. They plan and Allah plans and who's the best of planners. So you tell them, you deliver your message and you do it in the best way. Now, let's come to the main point of our talk tonight, which is how do we deal with the harsh attacks? Somebody comes to you, you on the Muslim, ain't you? <laughs> yeah. So you believe in Allah, don't you? Yep. How come you guys is terrorists? What are you going to say? How come you guys have to beat your wives? 
Or like one woman asked me, how come you men can have four wives and a woman can't have four husbands? Why do you have to oppress women? How come you have to kill all the Jews and Christians? Why is your religion so violent? Hmm? So what do you say? Has anybody ever sat with you and showed you the right way to respond to this? Because we have the best example on earth of how to reply to those types of harsh attacks. And who am I talking about? Some of the some. No doubt about it. Did he have a problem? Every single day they give him a problem. The Qureshi tribe, his own relatives, man. Coming at him. And by the way, they weren't just coming up and saying things to hurt his feelings. They were hurting the Muslims physically. True or false? How many of you know about the occasion when he and Abu Bakr were both right by the Kaaba? And the Quraysh nearly beat them to death. They had to haul them home, drag them home. And Abu Bakr nearly died. But when he came to, all he could worry about was the Prophet and he wasn't going to relax until he knew Rasulullah was okay. You remember the story? They nearly beat him to death. Okay, so what happened? So the Prophet said, okay, okay, everybody tonight, get your weapons and sneak up on them, and we're going to go in and blow them up, and nope. Nope. That was still in the early years. That was in Mecca. They had no commandment. And the Prophet didn't make up the religion. It has to come from Allah. And without a commandment to do it, they can't do it. All they can do is self-defense, which, of course, anybody can do that. When the orders for battle came, they were very clear. And even today in the Geneva Convention, they cannot match, they can't touch the laws and the rules for battle that Islam has. Can't even get close. It's too beautiful. First, you have to have the circumstance that Allah is describing in the Quran. It can't be that you're going out here fighting for money. There's no such thing as being mercenaries in Islam. You can't fight for money. They can. Right now in the United States, we have a huge number of people being trained in private camps, private businesses, training people to be mercenaries, and then renting them out to the United States to the tune of over $100,000 a month each. Have you heard about it? You're looking at me like you got no clue what I'm talking about. It's called Blackwater. That's one of them. One of six of the major ones. And the guy that runs it's a personal friend of Mr. B's. Yeah, take care of your buddies. Those are mercenaries. We can't do that. Kill for money, you can't do it. Property, same thing. No. Nope. And again, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about self-defense that everybody always has the right to self-defense. That's common sense. But when it comes to organizing and going in battle, there's a name for it in Arabic. Do you know what it is? What is it? You guys are freezing up on me, man. What, are you afraid of the secret cameras in here or something? Somebody said, Sheikh, is it the J word? No, it's not the J word. The word actually has the reference to, to killing. It's called kital, from kittel. And this is the word Allah is using in the Quran. But it means to engage in a type of fight that can wind up in death. In English, it has the word mortal combat. 
And this is what's mentioned in Quran. But there are so many things that have to be in place and it has to be followed a certain way. That's why the Prophet never allowed anybody to do this until they had it from Allah and how to do it and when to do it and most important of all, when not to do it. They use the term in the translators, they use this in verse 190 of Surah Baqarah, they use the term in English, fight. But more appropriately, it should be combat. Because fighting, you imagine somebody standing there going, tu, 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 tu. <laughs> Kittle. No, it's more like, tu, 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 tu. you know, this is a lot closer. Fight them when they fight you, but stop if they stop. Otherwise, you're the aggressor, and verily Allah doesn't love the aggressors. Verse 191, next says, him. Now, this is the imperative, like Quran. Quran is a word, it's a noun. Qari, one who recites. Ekara, you recite. That's the imperative of the word. So, waqtuluhum, aqtuluhum, because wa just means and, says, kill them, but it's in combat. So it's the same word again. Killing combat or mortal combat. Wherever you find them, turn them out from where they turned you out. Now, what did that mean? That was specific, wasn't it? They never read the rest of that verse, by the way, because right away the people would be going, who got turned out? What was that all about? So they just stopped short. And that's another kind of lying, is to take part of a verse and just show that. And in, that, in actuality, it was talking specifically about when they go for Hajj. If you go back to verse 189, you can see that there are three things that are being asked to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yes, so Lunica, they're asking you, that's how the verse starts out, about such things as the moons, and this is to know when to do hajj, and entering your house by the wrong doors, and that's superstition, don't do that. And then the subject of, when are we ever going to get to fight? I mean, you know, 13 years, and we've just been hassled to death, all we want to do is go do hajj. So this is when it was pertaining to that, and going back to the place which was their own land, their own homes, their own families, their own property. And they were uh, being told now by Allah, yes, you can go back, and if they fight you, you can fight them. And you can even turn them back out of the property they stole from you and take your land back. But it has these conditions to go with it, because before that, they never had any of the conditions. Arabs, before Islam came, were very tribal and feudal, meaning that they would just go after it and go after it and kill and kill and kill with no limits. Have you heard about the battle? The feud actually that they had over a camel race? There was a big camel race and the winner of the, the race, a certain camel, another boy is jealous so he picks up a rock and throws it and kills the camel. So they killed the boy. So those people killed their boy and then they started killing each other and you know how long it went? 40 years. To the extent that people couldn't remember what the battle was about anymore. Why are we killing these people? Over a stupid camel race. Now aren't you glad we don't have camel races anymore? Of course we do have football. Oops. <laughs> it gets pretty rough too, doesn't it? But you can see, if you put it in context, this is nothing like what the people are trying to claim Islam is saying. There's nothing like that. Especially because it has the warning marks in there. Stop if they stop. And it repeats that again, even after this thing about turning them out and everything. But still, if they stop, it's up to Allah. It's back to Allah again. Notice how many times when you're dealing with your enemies, even if it's in your house, you've got a problem with your wife, but once they stop, back off and don't keep jamming it in their face. 
That's in Surah An-Nisa. It doesn't say it like that in, in Arabic, but I'm trying to give you the essence of what it's telling you about. For sure, the more you study Islam in Arabic, and the more you understand how these things all fit together, there's no way you'd ever let anybody convince you that there's a single thing wrong with Islam. There's a lot wrong with some Muslims, no doubt. And I'll put myself in that category. But there's nothing wrong with Islam. Islam is perfect. Because Islam describes a relationship between us and our Lord. Islam is based on those words. You've heard me say it. If you know any of our programs, I say it in every program. Islam is surrender, submission, obedience, sincerity, and peace. And when those five things are together, and you're having this relationship with your Lord, that's the best relationship there is. He's the boss and you're not. And as long as we adhere to this relationship with our Lord, doing what he wants us to do on his terms, we're going to be okay. But now, how do I respond when these guys come up to me? And I'm going to leave you with this and let you think about it. It doesn't matter how they attack you. It doesn't matter what they say or how they do it. Train yourself. You can go in front of the mirror so you can do this. So that you can be like the companions of Rasul and how they had to respond in those early years, especially before the verses came. Because you, by the way, you, you, can't, you cannot get together and get a little group and go out here and do stuff like that today. This, that's not Islam. It has to be under authority. We don't have authority. You cannot do that. Okay? You are being tested. And this is your test, just as it was for many of the Sahabi. Somebody come to you and insult you, say something bad, like some of the things I mentioned. I'm going to throw another one out. How come you guys worship a black box in the desert and kiss the ground five times a day? <coughs> Thank you for asking me about my religion. Try it. Thank you for asking me about my religion. Thank you for asking me about my religion. Hey. How come your wife got that rag on her head? Thank you for asking me about my religion. In my case, how come you look like Santa Claus? Thank you for asking me about my religion and you're getting nothing for Christmas. <laughs> but seriously, seriously, you just be nice and tell him thank you. Because guess what? Now he's stuck. Because you acted like you didn't know it was an insult. And only the worst of the worst of the drunks is going to persist after that. He'll be like, uh, uh, well, uh, <clears throat> would you like to have the answer to your question? Would you like to sit down and have coffee? We can talk. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, oh, can I get your email? I'll send you something or phone number. We can talk. Maybe you're in a hurry or something. Uh, 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 uh. It works. It's perfect because they didn't come to really ask you. I told you this is not about clearing up misconceptions. This is about the ones who came to attack. Now some of them do it out of ignorance. There's no doubt about that because they picked it up from people who are trying to program them to do this stuff. But some of them are exactly that. In any case, when you say, thank you for asking me about my religion, and you smile, they're going to go, okay, 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 that's it, that's it, I'm out of here. And that's good. That's really good. But when it comes to the issue, if you happen to know the answer, the proper answer, you'd be surprised how many times it turns the whole thing around. It just turns it upside down in the other way. Here's one for you. When they ask you, how come a man can have four wives, but a woman can't have four husbands? Thank you for asking me about my religion. In Islam, there are two important things. I always say this. First is the truth, meaning that I have to say the truth or I can go to hell. The second thing is the proof. Even if I make a mistake, you can find it out real easy because everything of Islam, there's only one version. 
There's only one version of Quran. There's only one version of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu It's all one. So it's real easy. If Islam teaches it or doesn't teach it, it's known. We can ask any of our scholars, it'll be the same. So we have both. Truth, proof. We got the evidence. But sometimes questions have a problem in the question because the question is the statement with a question mark. Let me give you an example. Somebody asks you, can you answer this question, yes or no? Answer, only two choices you have is say yes or no. It's about your mother. Is she out of jail yet? My mother's never been, ah! That was a yes or no question. But my mother's never been, ah! Is your mother out of jail yet? Yes or no? Yes, good, I'm glad she got out. So it didn't matter what you said, you're stacked up because of the way the question is, yeah? So in this case, we have to straighten the question out. Oh, and there's one more little thing. And that is, well, I'm giving you the answer. If you hear something that you like, you see the sense of it, the common sense, and you find that what you thought was actually upside down, are you going to be ready to reconsider your position and start to worship your God and my God without partners? Because, by the way, that's all Islam is really about, worshiping God. That's what Islam is about. You ready for the answer? He's going to be going, huh? How did I get into this deal? Because you are telling him exactly what he needs to know. Islam is about worshiping God on his terms. Let's check that out. You ask me now about four wives and one husband, yeah? Well, according to Islam, there is something called no sex except in marriage. Now, the Catholic Church kind of goes to an extreme. For the most holy and righteous of all the men or all the women, they have no sex, period, ever. Because they can't get married, can't have children, never going to have any grandchildren. Nuns, priests, bishops, cardinals, even a pope, never, ever, ever get married and never have sex. Well, at least they're not supposed to. <laughs> that was the whole idea, wasn't it? But Islam is not saying that. It's just saying no sex that's not sanctioned by Allah, meaning you have to get married, meaning you have to have a contract, a written contract with the lady so that she has something to get her rights with. Because when Islam came, women weren't getting their rights. But now women get their rights. Women, and you can begin to explain how it is that in Islam, women have the right to own property. Women have the right to vote. It's 1,400 years. They didn't have to go through women's suffrage like we had in our country. Women have the right to be women. They don't have to be men to try to get money so they can have the things they want. They can just be women and stay home do things at home and still get money comes to them. How? Because it's the man's responsibility to take care of them, to bring them food, to bring them clothes, to help them with education about Islam especially. All the things Islam is providing, these people don't even know about this subject. And a woman who has even any kind of property at all, whether she's very rich or not so rich, never has to give a dime to support the household. If a man is a street cleaner, making minimum wage, but he's married to a lady who's worth a half a million dollars, she doesn't have to give him a quarter. He still pays for the house, he still pays for the utilities, he still pays for the car, it's his responsibility. You can't marry a woman for her money in Islam. But a woman can marry a man for his money, easy. 
Because Islam has the ideal thing that every woman's looking for. It's called, what's mine's mine, and what's his is mine too. <laughs> it's not a joke, it's, it's a truth. By now the guy's going, I didn't know that. I didn't know that, see? Now I watch it turn, watch it turn. And this is just one example. So a woman has so many rights in Islam that she is considered the queen of the house. And that's a very big royal status in Islam for a woman to be a Muslim woman and queen of her house. Something nice. Respect, honor, dignity. And a man in Islam cannot cheat on his wife. The punishment for it is you don't want to know. You don't even think about it. That's why you see brothers. You, again, this is something you take for granted. But I'm trying to tell you that I know both sides. And if you see it, the difference between the young brothers for the Muslims and these other youngsters out here in college, jobs and so on, or without jobs, and a girl goes by, Muslim sees a girl go by, and the other boy sees a girl go by, and both of them do this. Okay? The, boy, the Muslim's not supposed to, but he's going, like this, and the boy's going like this. Both of them did the same thing. But what's the difference is what one of them is saying. One of them is saying, stuff for Allah, stuff for Allah, stuff for Allah. Look, it's fitting, man, it's fitting. Yes or no? <laughs> the other one's going, ha ha, mama. <laughs> yes or no? Even here in Australia, the brothers still have Islam. They still know this is wrong. This is not the right way to be. We don't like it. I want to get married. That's the answer, isn't it? That's not what those other guys are saying. They're looking for instant solution to their problem. And Muslims don't do that. Muslims are looking to get married. And Prophet Sallallahu told us, get the children married as soon as they're old enough. Don't wait till they're 21, because then they're fully grown. That's not Islam. It's not what the Prophet Sallallahu taught us. Is it? Okay, you gotta be honest. That's what this lecture is about, by the way. Along with that, getting married, when you get married, there's a whole lot about giving rights to the lady, is that right? She has a wakil or a wali who is responsible for her. And he's taking care to be sure she gets a fair deal. And whatever's, oh, and here's another thing. Dowry for Christians has always been girls pay the boys. How many of you knew that? The dowry goes the other way. And, uh, and for 2,000 years, now just in the last couple decades, the women are going, hey, I, why should I have to give any money? <coughs> but it's always been in Islam, the men have to take care of the women. Right? Always. So when you get married, you give her. And she gets to tell you what it's going to be. Or you can make an offer, and if she doesn't like it, she'll say, no, we need more than that. That's not right. If he could say, well, you know, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned to one of the Sahabi just to teach her one ayah from the Quran. He said, yeah, because he didn't have anything else, okay? Go back out there in your BMW and do, dig around a little bit, you know? Because that ain't going to work. She has the right. Because that's what Islam is about, about rights. About now, the person you're talking about, he's going, whoa, uh, he wishes he didn't get into this. You're telling him things he never heard of before. But check this out. In Islam, the man is the one who is having the heavy burden when it comes to support. The woman doesn't support anything. And it's set up in Islam that the women have extra protection so that they don't wind up out in the streets with nothing. 
They don't wind up as old bag ladies. They don't wind up as prostitutes. They don't wind up with a child with no father. Islam is providing for them in the best way. Even if you're in a society with 20 women, 20 women out here, and only six or seven men, no problem. It's not a problem. Because each of those men can take on the responsibility of up to four. Yeah? Now, if you got seven men, 20 women, still got one opening. Yeah? No more than that, because it's four. So it's not a problem. Not only that, though, and this is usually where I cap it with them. I ask them, have you ever considered if you have 100 women on this side and 100 men on that side? As soon as you marry this man to this woman, here, we got a match, how many are left? 99 on both sides. So let's start getting them married till we get down to the very end. And we find all of a sudden, there's five men left and five women left. Now, what's the choice? Man can only choose from the five, right? Right? Because in Islam, the woman cannot have more than one husband. Well, one of the reasons, by the way, is because a child born wouldn't know who the father was. And when it comes time for inheritance, how would you know how to distribute it? That's one of the rights of the child. But to come back to this, the man over here can only choose from the unmarried women, true? But the women, who do they get to choose from? Every single man there is still eligible to her. Because they don't have four wives yet. <coughs> Who's got the most choice? See, you never thought of that. Never hit you. Did Allah, see, because we're not Allah, we can't think like God. But Allah knows what he created. And there's always more women on this earth than there are men. Today, it's more than four to one. But that's not the point of having the discussion. I'm just saying, who has the most choice? The woman, because the man is stuck. He's only got five women to choose from, or three women. Or what if there's only one woman left? That's it. That's your wife. That's it. And I don't care if she's really healthy, you know. That's it. But for the ladies, they can choose from any other man as long as he doesn't have four wives. Now, what's another advantage of that is a man gets around. We're social. We know each other. We know who's what, where, going on, la, la, la. But the women don't. They're, a lot of times they don't know what's up. And they might think, oh, this guy, he's real nice. But then they find out, oh, he's stingy. He slaps his wife around. He does, you know, thing. I don't like that. I wish I would know that beforehand. Well, how would you know? Well, it's real easy because if she's already, if she has a friend that's already married to the guy, she'd know. Word gets out real fast. Who is the nice guy, really? And who's the one praying and going to the masjid and praying charity? And so this is one of the ways that she is being benefited by this. So who's got the most choice and who's got the most benefit? And by now the guy's going, I didn't know that, I didn't know that. It happened, actually it happened, a woman had asked me the same way. And when we got to the end of the thing, Shadu la ilaha illallah, Shadu Muhammad Rasulullah. Why? Because it becomes clear that this is not from a human being. No human could have figured all of this out. And nothing in Islam said you had to marry four women. <laughs> The Sahabi, the companions of Muhammad Sallallahu when the order came, it didn't say marry four women. It said marry other women because it was talking about not taking the orphan girls and marrying them to get their money away from them. That's what it's talking about, the verse before it. Marry other women of your choice, Ithna, two, Salat, three, Arab, four, 
if you can treat them with equality. And that's what makes it so great. Because if I have one wife and I give her this and this and this, I have to give the other wife the same thing. I cannot mistreat her and put her lower than this one. They have to have the same status. Social status, material status, you have to provide for them. And if you stay a night with this one, you have to stay a night with that one. This is the deal. Your time, your money, your resources, it's theirs. Hmm. So the companions of Muhammad, they weren't like out on the street going, hey, we can get wives. No, come on. They already had wives. It was not forbidden for them to have multiple wives. What they did, they had to divorce wives. Yes or no? It was like, oh, not eh. So that you understand what I'm trying to get across. There are a lot of things that we take for granted today because we're trying to put our mindset of the mentality of the people around us, of the society that we live in, and we're not realizing how it came. We're not realizing the ramifications of the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the hukum. It's very important to understand the rulings and the wisdom with it. Because then when you do, and somebody asks you a stupid question like that, you can say, thank you for asking me about my religion. And then when you begin, you're going to be surprised at how quick it'll go the other way. One of two things will happen when I get through talking to them. One of two things will happen. Either they're going to make shahada, or they're going to shut up. And they're never going to do it again. And remember, again, I'm going to repeat, this is, I'm only talking about the cases of real harsh attacks and harsh treatment. I'm not saying about the one who just has misconceptions who doesn't understand. This is for the one who comes to you and wants to treat you harsh. Treat him good, treat him better than good, but then lay it out real smooth and let him realize that what he's got is nothing compared to what you have. In the true Muslim society, where Muslims are practicing real Islam with Islamic State, you have a much, much better overall community than you do anywhere else. And that's for Muslims and non-Muslims alike. It's just a safer place and a better place. I'm going to end it now by telling you what happened with one person. Not that he was harsh at all, he was a lovely person. But I, but I was reminded just now of something that happened with him. He was in the hospital, and the one taking care of him happened to be a Muslim who had, uh, was a med student and was taking care of this man along with other patients. And the man became interested and fascinated in talking to him. Every time I saw him, I asked him about Islam, something else about Islam, Islam, Islam. So I happened to be visiting there in the UK. It was in England. And they asked me if I would go and see this man, just talk to him for a few minutes. So I went to see him. He's a very nice man. He used to drive a truck. In fact, right here in Australia is where he was from. And he's old, but he liked to talk about the old days, what he used to do. And I asked him, because he kept talking about Australian relatives that he had here. So just one time I just said to him, well, what's your favorite country? I knew he was going to say Australia. No doubt. He said Saudi Arabia. I said, huh? You've been in Saudi Arabia? He said, oh yeah, I used to drive a truck from here to there to Europe from this and that. So he had literally driven everywhere. But he said, of all the places I ever went, I never felt more safe, secure, or at ease than in Saudi Arabia. I still didn't get it. But I know how I feel when I go to Medina, but I know he didn't go to Medina because they don't let him in. Not there. So what is he talking about? He said, you know, I used to park my rig. That's what he calls his truck and trailer, you know. He said, I used to park my rig. I could leave the keys in it and go over and have a cup of coffee, talk to people, and I could come back. I knew it was going to be just like it was. Nobody's going to touch it. He said, they're Muslims. They won't do it. He said, Muslims there who are conscious of their way, best people. That's what he said. It wasn't the heat that he liked. Don't get me wrong. He was talking about the people. Because that was our subject. Talking about people. I said, what do you like best? He said, Saudi Arabia. 
So I said to him, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach you something. And it was what I heard when I came in here. You were given shahada. It was beautiful. Because I told him, this is the shahada. You say this like this, you know, I shall do. And la ilaha illallah, I shall Muhammad Rasulullah. What it means, I bear witness, there's none to worship except Allah. I bear witness, Muhammad's his messenger. He smiled at me and he said, that's all it takes? I said, that'll get you started. He said, I say it every morning when I wake up and I say it every night before I go to bed. I almost fell over. And when we were on our way back, the brother was driving and he said, how come you didn't give him shahada? I said, that brother could give me shahada. <laughs> well, this is not about a formal piece of paper, you know. He already has it. He already believes it. We'd talked several times about the subject. I thought he needed to make shahada. I didn't know he's saying it all the time. And he said it while I was sitting there. He said, you don't need to jump up and shake my hand and go there. No, he said it. That's it. SubhanAllah. So we don't know really when we're talking to people who might flip and go the other way. I used to be one who used to attack Islam because I was totally ignorant. And all I knew is what other preachers had told me. I had never met a Muslim, never did business with a Muslim. I didn't know about the truth factor. I didn't know anything. It wasn't until I met a Muslim and did business with him and watched him and his Islam that I understood about this beautiful deen. So I'm just encouraging you that when people come to you this way, don't respond the same way that they're coming to you. Remember, thank you for asking me about my religion. Islam is built on two important things, truth and proof. And we have to tell you the way it is. Now, if you don't know the answer, tell them I don't know, but we'll get back to you. Let me get your email. On, or if you don't want to give it to me, I'll give you an email and you can write. Yusuf, Y-U-S-U-F, at shareislam.com. That's one of our many websites. And then you can also go to our websites to learn the answers to these and many other questions. Today I posted 15 ayahs of the Quran that are misquoted out of context. And they're used by those who particularly want to destroy Islam. Those 15 ayahs are on one of our websites and then the explanation that goes with it. Okay, I'm the composer, but I'm not the one to put it all together. We actually have scholars who help us do these things. So if you want to go there, it's called Islam Newsroom. Islam Newsroom. And in the search box, put the word misquoting. Not misquote, misquoting. And it'll pull up misquoting Quran. There's five parts to this because it's very big. You may want to turn it into a PDF file. There's a, click, a button you can click it, turn it into a PDF file. You can print the whole thing out and make a book for you. So that when people come to you with this stuff, you got the answers. Clear answers. And you can even give it to them. So here, read it. Inshallah, this will spread Islam faster than you can imagine. Because Allah can use something very negative to spread Islam. In fact, I've watched it happen many times. But I went further than I wanted to go in the talk, but I wanted to be sure to hit this main point. No matter what other people do to you, you're still responsible in front of Allah to be a good Muslim. And I'm making dua that you hang fast with that. If I don't do anything else this whole tour while I'm here in Australia, except get that one point out to keep us patient, keep us in sabr. And Allah says, in Allah ma'a sabrin. Allah be with you. Allah keep you strong. Allah keep your feet in his deen always. And forgive us and give us his jannah. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.